Welcome to Coffee with Democrats, a sensible platform for progressive conversations. Coffee with Democrats is a grassroots movement dedicated to hearing from Democrats, candidates, legislators, and friends from all political backgrounds who want great conversations. Coffee with Democrats is committed to increasing Democrat voter registration and Democrat voter turnout by making voting more exciting and meaningful. And with us today is a special guest host of Coffee with Democrats, former chief of the Osage Nation, Chief Jim Gray. Uh, good morning. We are here today on Coffee with Democrats. Um, and a special guest today, guest host for Coffee with Democrats, is the former chief of the Osage Nation, Jim Gray. We also have uh, Walter Lamar. Walter Lamar is uh, a former FBI agent. He's been recognized highly with uh, uh, within the FBI and within the law enforcement community with his work with both what took place down in Waco during the Branch Davidian um, siege, as well as the Oklahoma bombing. He's been highly decorated within the FBI and uh, accommodated for that. Uh, we also are expecting guests with Michael Anderson. He is a attorney who specializes in uh, Indian nation um, law. He is going to be a, a great participant today. He did graduate from Columbia University and he's highly respected within the, the uh, Native American and First, uh, First Americans um, uh, legal side, and particularly the part about uh, making sure that, that indigenous policy and procedures is uh, is proper when as far as it goes to um, Hollywood and making sure that Hollywood uh, recognizes uh, the the processes there. Then we also have Holly Cook Macaro. Uh, she is uh, a very highly respected person within uh, both politics as well as within the, the Native American nation. Uh, she is um, a, a, an advocate that is uh, very, um, very helpful. So we're looking forward to, to having her come on this morning. She is also a, uh, uh, she, she's been an activist with the Democratic Party. So I hold that in high esteem as, um, as somebody that is uh, very involved with, uh, with politics. So we're looking forward to having her come on here as well. Uh, I will be uh, muting myself turning it over to uh, Chief Gray now. And in the meantime, I'm going to be reaching out to uh, Michael Anderson and to Holly to see if there are some issues with their Zoom um, to make sure that that they can can join us. So I'm going to I'm going to back out. I'm going to mute myself altogether. And I'm just going to turn it over to uh, Chief Jim Gray as our special host. And thank you so much for being our special host today. Thank you, Kevin. Um, just so you know, I, I just texted Mike and he's using the link you sent us this morning and he's not getting in. So I told him to use the one that you sent us last week. So hopefully he'll be able to get on soon enough to participate. And uh, so, uh, Walt, it's just me and you, maybe for the whole hour. Who knows? <laughs> hey, <laughs> well, you know, uh, maybe that's all the better. Yeah, maybe. right. We could. Uh, <laughs> we can talk about all the people that didn't make it to the panel. So I thought yeah, that would be good. Go. <laughs> no, actually, um, one of the, the things that, that really intrigued me uh, about the, the movie Killers of the Flower Moon, uh, obviously, it's uh, close uh, personally to me. And it's my family that's in this issue, this this story. And it's also my tribe that's in this story. And um but I think it has uh, a broader reach than that to all of Indian country, especially as it pertains to um, uh, law enforcement issues, which features prominently in this film and the book as well. And uh, as somebody who's worked in a Federal Bureau of Investigation, which is part of this story as well, the beginnings of it, as well as the, uh, the, the actual work that you've devoted your career to, uh, in law enforcement as a federal official, both at the FBI level, as well as the Department of Interior and even the Bureau of Indian Affairs. And as a one-time director, that, I think that's how we met years ago. And um, so I thought maybe just as a general rule, um, can you talk about how important it is for Hollywood, who's engaged in multiple movie projects, both on the screen and in television and streaming, where law enforcement issues have come up. Uh, I can think of dark winds. I can think of uh, 
uh, Yellowstone, Longmire, uh, Wind River. Uh, there's numerous uh, movies that have come out where law enforcement features prominently in the story. How important is it that we get this right? And just feel free to expand on whatever aspect that you feel is important. Um, and, and I'll say, I just got a text from Holly. Uh, so Kevin, she is in the waiting room. So she's been waiting, but um, Chief Gray, uh, number one, thank you for inviting me to participate this morning. Uh, and Kevin, I, I wanna thank you for uh, presenting this platform and forum for us mm -hmm. to talk about some of these issues because they are, uh, I think they're not only issues that are important to us in the native community, uh, but across our communities in this country, it, it, you know, and it's, and it's uh, as I was thinking about coming on today, I, uh, I mean, for a long time, a very long time, uh, Native American portrayals in television and in the movie industry, and, and I'll say, uh, Chief Gray, I can include you in this, uh, as baby boomers, <laughs> we, we, Just on the we, cusp. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we recall uh, as children that that contradictory emotion of seeing us on screen, uh, whether it was our little black and white uh, television tubes or whether it was at the big screen at the, at the movie theater, we were kind of proud that we were thought of, uh, but we were horrified in the way we were thought of, mm -hmm. right? We were kind of proud to see ourselves, but we were at the same time horrified and so now we fast forward to, to the past several years and and maybe a little bit beyond that even we've seen this amazing surge uh native content on television and now streaming networks mm -hmm. and and what i would say is and uh, thinking about this is that our stories are safer when we're involved when we're involved in the process, whether we be financiers, whether we be directors, producers, writers, actors, and then cultural and content consultants. So right. we'll touch on that law enforcement question in, in, in a second too. But with this amazing surge and 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 the importance of of us being and and I and I don't say us, I I, I say the industry being right about. Um, what the content is. I mean, you know, if a story revolves around heart implant surgery, they're going to have absolutely going to have a consultant that's that's right. going to work, run them through and make sure that they're a consultant to talk about uh, heart implants. Mm -hmm. But when when you well, you want to get it right. So if you're producing a movie that has uh, or a TV series that includes um, native content, absolutely it's a bit more complicated than the one consultant scenario and you think about our cultural diversity our, our geographic demographic diversity the the complexities of sovereignty the government to government relationships that roller coaster of federal policy then when you're asking about the criminal justice systems i mean it's laced with jurisdictional nuance and 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 when we are not part of that entire process you know, and, and days gone by that, that um, when we were portrayed, it's just as I said, it, it was in a horrifying ways oftentimes, and it, it gradually progressed at a point where when we're portrayed, they're missing it still by a mile, right? right, right. And now as, we're, as we're, we're moving into present day, they're missing it more like by feet, but they're mm -hmm. still missing it. And they're still missing it because oftentimes the you know their their thought is as well if we've got a native consultant, then that person can cover the gamut of everything that we're going to be presenting, whether it be cultural, whether it be law enforcement, whether it has to do with our communities and our languages. They expect that now they've got that one native person there they can check the box. Mm -hmm. It's absolutely not true. And and when I've watched these television shows, and there are things that that I'm gonna uh, that I'm gonna see that you know a lot of folks don't because it's the law enforcement part. But right. we want authenticity and accuracy. We want this to be right because this is our opportunity to make damn sure that our story is told correctly. Right. So to do that, the industry has to recognize that it's you don't get on the phone and 
call up one native and have them show up and and now you've checked the box and you've you've covered it yeah it's much more than that and and when you brought up earlier about uh, killers of the flower moon well it was it was it 2020 or 2021 when the announcement first came out that that the movie was going to be made right and I and I somebody called me and asked me, well, what's my thought about it? Because of the, you know, it's about the birth of the FBI. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, immediately I said, well, the FBI genesis should only be an interesting factoid as part of this. Right. I mean, you're going to tell the story of the Oklahoma City bombing. You're going to tell the story of the tragedy. Mm-hmm. And then you're going to have as a as the side story the investigation and talking about the investigation. Mm-hmm. Likewise, here my hope was that 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 the FBI, the birth of the FBI would be an interesting factoid, but that the story would revolve around the Osage people, the tragedy, and to tell that story. And and um, and Mike Anderson, I see he's here now, but he and I talked about it and the fact that Osage leadership, including yourself, had an opportunity on the front end to meet with mm-hmm. uh, um, Martin Scorsese, uh, that it changed the trajectory and it yeah. changed the story. Now, I haven't seen the movie, but talking to you and others mm-hmm. that have, uh, that basically is now what happened, that the FBI genesis is, is an interesting factoid, but the, the movie concentrates on, on um, the, the tragedy and the true story. And so I'll, I'll just add one more thing to this, though, but I, I feel like um, the 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 movie is concentrated there but the commentary surrounding the movie and that it's our responsibility to address is a fact that this didn't it i mean there with the osage people was as 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 tragic and 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 as horrific as it could be but the same story is across our communities across absolutely the Indian country right. whether whether it be um Precious metals, whether it be timber, water, uranium, coal, you know, natural na- natural gas, even grazing leases and farm agriculture. Yeah, easement. absolutely. And and in every case, the, the anything that we own or control, there's always been the risk of hucksters, opportunists, criminals, thieves, and 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 it, and the commentary that we have to promote is that it goes on yet today. Mm-hmm. That this yeah. the killers of the flower moon is a is a is a is going to be an, a, an an incredible platform for us to tell that part of the story as well so um, well look no further than the missing and murdered indigenous women issue that is in in today's newspapers today so i would say that you're absolutely correct these issues are still happening um thank you mike i, I wanted to uh uh, ask uh, Holly, uh, one of the things that we did in our introduction was to talk about some of your work that you've done both politically as well as your your work in Indian country in terms of getting um, uh, the movie industry more prepared for um, taking on indigenous content because that seems to be the topic of interest at this point. We're, we're seeing a surge in uh, of content coming out in all platforms, movies, television, streaming services. And uh, there's a there's a real ripe opportunity for Indian country to engage in a in a in an equal basis in a way that maybe we haven't been in the past. And your work as uh, chair of the Illuminative organization certainly has brought a lot of that to light in the last uh, uh, five years. And uh, I thought maybe this might be a good time for you to to pitch the work that you do there a little bit and, and, and hopefully expand on where you see things moving in the post Killers of the Flower Moon era that we think is going to happen. That's going to, I think, explode even more interest in indigenous content. Thanks, Jim. Uh, thanks for having me this morning. And um, I think you've hit on what we're really seeing right now is is a renaissance in Indian country, not just in, in the film industry, but mm-hmm. in politics, right? I all of us, you know, I see, you know, Walt Lamar, Michael Anderson, we've all worked in in the political space for so long and um coming at it from different different uh, 
perspectives and and roles. Mark, uh, Michael and I were in the Clinton administration together. And th- and I look back then and on how different things were. We used to get so excited when the president would include Native Americans when he you know listed off communities of color. And um, and we expect so much more now and rightfully so. Um, this renaissance, I think, in terms of politics and visibility and all of that, I think, you know, we're, we are seeing in much more accurate portrayals in the film industry. And mm-hmm. my work at Illuminative is as chair of the board, right? Crystal Echohawk is, is the founder and the real visionary behind the work mm-hmm. at Illuminative and along with a really tremendous team there. And that that work and the identifying, I, I always say that Crystal saw a space that needed to be filled, right? And Illuminative um, provides I think both social media content, which is so important in in um, driving a message, in right. um, pushing a narrative or calling something out, and she does it in a very nimble way. The team at Illuminative is is very responsive um, from things like Rick Santorum's inappropriate comments to things like you know helping get over the finish line the changing of the name of the Washington professional football team. All of those things, you know, they were team efforts, but um, the amplification of um, how to accurately portray Indian country, Native Americans, our stories, how to tell Mm -hmm. our stories in a way that is not the commercialization or just perpetuating what we've always known is as the Hollywood Indian or the Hollywood version of Indians. And that work over the last, I think for, we just crossed the five-year mark at Illuminative. Um, it, I think all of that in conjunction with, with so many people who've done this work for so long, right? We all stand on their shoulders. Um, we are approaching a time, and as we see Killers of the Flower Moon, I'm actually in New York City today, and I saw this huge billboard. And wow. it's Leonardo DiCaprio, Robert De Niro, and Lily Gladstone. And it brought tears to my eyes to think, this it's so incredible to see it's and, moving uh, isn't it yeah. it really it, it <laughs> you know it's surprisingly emotional when you see mm-hmm. that um it, it's such a big deal to us and mm-hmm. um really it marks a, a place i think in time in history and i think we're on the brink of seeing um hopefully another momentous time in history as we move towards award season um mm-hmm. but all of that it's it's this this renaissance in Indian country, I think the electoral politics, the the rise of the influence and power of Indian country and the voice of Indian country, politics and media, and um, and in film, where yeah. it's, a, it's a remarkable time. Well, thank you. Um, I, I wanted to say a few words about uh, Yancey's inability to come on to this uh, podcast. He, he called me last night, and he was terribly sorry that he wasn't going to be able to participate. And, uh, and I know some of you who have followed his... Uh, sudden rise to uh, uh, stardom with his participation in this film was even echoed even in the most recent final uh, episode of Reservation Dogs, which I hope we have time to talk a little bit about as well. But uh, here's where I think uh, if, if if Yancey was here, I, would, I wouldn't put him on the spot to ask him about his experience in the film. And certainly because of the ongoing strike with the actors, he has to, you know, protect the solidarity of the group by not participating in any media. And I respect that and everything. I was happy to say, well, let's just talk about your record collection. I don't care. Just get yeah. on the call, you know. But um, as it turned out, he had a project that he did want to talk about. And, uh, and if it's all right with you, I'd like to say a few words about it. His dad, uh, the late Charles Redcorn, was a historian. And, 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 and throughout his entire life was a writer. He was... Uh, he had an Ivy League education, and he came back home and and worked and devoted his life to Indian country. And throughout his life, he sat down and talked to people, Osages, who had experienced the kind of tragedy that is documented in Killers of the Flower Moon. But in their cases, their stories were never investigated. What was happened to them it speaks to the multiple number of unsolved cases that were uninvestigated during that period of time. And for the sake of those memories, he wrote a fictional novel in a way that told their stories without disclosing their names. And 
But as I remember talking to him about it years ago, when he wrote the book back in 2002, uh, he said, I said, why did you write a fiction? You know, everybody's doing a, a nonfiction version of this, you know, and he says, I wanted to write it fiction so that I could tell the truth. If you get my meaning, the stories were completely taken from oral testimonies that he took down over the course of 30, 40 years of visiting with elders who had survived that period of time. And uh, he captured it in a book called A Pipe for February. And it was so moving to be able to know that Yancey had auditioned and got the part to play Chief Bonnycastle of, in the movie and, and played the chief of the tribe. And during his engagement with the filmmakers, specifically Scorsese, they struck up a conversation about A Pipe for February. Scorsese wanted to see it and he showed it in the book and he read it. And um, it wasn't too much longer after that during the production that he decided to add a scene to the film. And I'm I'm going to break my tradition and, and just give you just a small spoiler. The opening scene in the book of A Pipe for February is the opening scene in Killers of the Flower Moon. And he acquired the rights to use that scene for the purpose of the film because the beginning of that scene was so moving. And, and, and even though it, it to the visitor just watching it in the film, watching it in the theater who may not be Native American or Osage, they're going to see an opening scene that takes place 20, 25 years before the events of Killers of the Flower Moon. And uh, and my, uh, my impression from that experience is to watch how the Osage elders at that particular period of time anticipated what changes were going to come. And they were trying to prepare their people, that next generation, that some of these old ways were going to have to evolve into embracing a new world. And we were going to have to walk in two worlds and we were going to have to accept certain things. And that's the dynamic of a pipe for February is that push and pull of what do you hang on to? What do you adapt? What do you resist? Exist? What do you embrace? Who do you love? Who do you trust? All these things are wrapped up in this book. And I am so excited about the fact that that part of that book is in this movie. And it just means a lot to me as an Osage and as somebody who, who grew to know and love and respect uh, a, a dear elder who, who unfortunately won't be able to see this. And I know that if Yancey was here, he would be expressing these kind of sentiments as well, that uh, this is such an important piece of book. And, it, and just recently, they did a second printing at the University of Oklahoma Press, where Martin Scorsese wrote the forward to the reprint of the book, and David Grand wrote a back flap blurb promoting the book as well, and encouraging people to read it. So that's my shameless plug for A Pipe for February. And now I want to go to Mike and, uh, and say, you know, after what we heard from uh, from Walt and, and what we've heard from uh, Holly, uh, there's a practical aspect that uh, I think people have raised this question before. And you've actually dug into this area. Aside from your, his, his, you know, your your legendary career in Indian law world, um, you have branched out into doing some entertainment law and uh, and allowing tribes who may have an interest in this to uh help bankroll and finance and what are the challenges that you see for tribes that are engaged and maybe in order to really command that story sometimes it's better to be have an interest in that in the project can you talk a little bit about that with yeah you? great question you know i became i've always interested in film uh both uh the, the the renaissance in the 70s when you had little big man and outlaw josie wells and soldier blue some of my favorite native american films but in 2016, I was part of a, a featured in a documentary called Promised Land, which was about the struggle of the Duwamish tribe in Seattle to obtain federal recognition. And in talking to the producers and directors, I thought, wow, you know, this is great that uh, an independent film company can do a topic in film on a very specialized topic uh, like the Duwamish recognition. And since then, I've just seen a number of documentaries that are very specialized. They're in a niche market. but I've also seen in a, the broader context uh, with Killers of the Flower Moon, much more uh, commercially you know, marketable, larger films 
uh, and then films and TV shows like Dark Winds and Reservation Dogs. I mean, there has been a renaissance. And so as my clients look to expand, diversify from primarily gaming uh, establishments and that kind of uh, field and, and those endeavors, we started looking at Native American film. It's it doesn't have the margins, obviously, as a you know as a large casino would have, but uh, there is profit to be made both in the the smaller market and larger, uh, and so that's how I became involved in it. The BIA used to guarantee uh, uh, films through their guaranteed loan program. They're not really doing it as much now, but they also they they sponsored and uh, bankrolled Wind River and LBJ and some other films. And so that's uh, how my clients got involved in thinking that maybe they could diversify their economies, get into film, but also because they they really want to shape and form the content. They want Native American role models. And I'll just make my own shameless plug. Uh, both Walt and Holly are, and I are on the Native American Hall of Fame uh, board. Oh, yeah. We have an induction ceremony in a couple of weeks in Oklahoma City at the First American Museum. And one of our inductees is Will Sampson, who is a Muscogee Creek like I am. Uh, in the very early films, like when you didn't see a lot of Indian faces, but in One Flew of the Cuckoo's Nest, and he was also uh, in The Outlaw Josie Wells and in Poltergeist and some other films. But uh, so I had an historical kind of interest just from having a tribal member in film. But and now seeing that our clients want to actually do investment in films and, and expand into entertainment. If uh, just so we tie up this loose end here with Mike, if, if somebody wanted to participate, invest, sponsor, anything like that, where can they go and what can they do? Um, well, the film producers are always looking for investments. And so uh, if you read the trades, Variety and others, you'll see a film is in production. Um, I actually met with the, the, uh, the uh, production company for Killers of the Flower Moon at an early point and uh, before they'd actually really engaged with the Osage tribe. And I was mm -hmm. talking to them both about investment, also the things like using uh, traditional tribal regalia in the film, actual Osage language, and things that I later learned that they they parroted back <laughs> to the tribe they when they met did. with them. So that was terrific. They heard you. <laughs> yeah, but uh, and the, many other people, and I know the tribe eventually had a consultant uh, directly working with as a liaison to the, the film production company. But uh, it's basically following the trades and see what's in production. Uh, Films always need money, even the large films, whether it's a monster like Killers of the Flower Moon or very mm -hmm. small productions. And so um, it's one of the challenges for the filmmaker is to really they're sometimes they're great on the artistic side, but they're not great on the business side. So we you need a marketing plan. You need a sales agent. You need a uh, foreign distribution if that's the kind of film you're that's marketable there. But it's basically doing business in a uh, just artistic content, which is a challenge for many people. I think one of the the things that make uh, Killers of Flower Moon so interesting, and and I don't know if you all recall, but I, I the, the day the movie appeared uh, premiered at the Cannes Film Festival in France back in May, um, I had already seen the movie, and uh, I was uh, as one of the descendants of the people who are killed in this film. Um, the Apple thought it would be a good idea to invite the descendants of those that are featured in the film to be. Um, um, able to see it privately before it, it is shown worldwide. And um, so I had a chance to go to New York and watch it, a private screening. And uh, and so, but before I left, I had to sign a non-disclosure agreement. So you guys know what that's like, you know. Um, I got to see it, but I couldn't tell nobody about it. And uh, I have to say, it was probably the longest two and a half weeks of my life sitting here at my home and uh, not even able to talk to friends or family about what I got to see. And, um, but it was moving and it was incredibly, incredibly moving and it was powerful in its message. And, uh, um, and so it, these ideas have been rattling around in my head the whole time. And, uh, uh, and so the day the film premiered, I got an email from the lawyers uh, with Apple and saying, I've been lifted from my non-disclosure agreement. And I can talk about it at any time after 2.30 this afternoon, Central Time. So I had to wait, you know. And uh, and so when 2.30 hit, I started typing away and I made a series of tweets. And I thought about writing a review like your conventional critic review, you know, that everyone else would do, you know. And I thought, no, that's there's tons of people who can write that, you know. What can I write that maybe no one else would? 
And based on what I experienced watching the evolution from the book coming out to the movie rights being bought, to the outreach efforts, and to the response by the tribe as an evolutionary process of collaboration that eventually led to an active participation of between the tribe and Scorsese and the film company in making this film. And then after all that, getting in a chance to see it was so powerful. It, it, it doesn't answer every question people are going to have. Is it the story the Osages would have written? Probably not. But for the purposes of this film being made in such a collaborative manner, it blew my mind looking at the amount of artistic creativity and genuine uh, desire to get this story right by everybody who worked on the on the sets, to the people who worked in costume, to Robert De Niro's commitment to be able to speak Osage and do it in a convincing way was my biggest takeaways from that film. And so I wrote about all that in those tweets and saved very little to just talk about. I thought it was a great movie, you know, and I've never seen it like that because it didn't elevate the white savior narrative as a, uh, as a, as a, the FBI coming in on the white horse, saving the day. They solved one or two cases out of literally hundreds of unsolved mysterious deaths that maybe weren't so mysterious after all, but certainly unsolved, uninvestigated. And so the viewer is left understanding that the resilience of the Osage people was really the, the, the thing that got us through that period of time, and specifically Molly, the character Molly played by Lily Gladstone, so bravely and, 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 passionately controlling her energy and emotions staying in the realm of that character but knowing that she's osage and she's surrounded by all these forces some sharing her own bed and it is just an incredible movie i couldn't say enough things about how they interpreted that story and put it on the screen the way they did um that tweet Last time I checked, it was like 7.4 million views around the world. And uh, I didn't think people would care that much about process. But I want to throw the question to all of you. How important is process when it comes to getting that part right and not knowing until you see the final product whether or not that process produced a result that you could be proud of? Walt, you go first. Um well, Chief, number one, I think you must have talked to, to Scorsese about lighting tricks because you're doing a really good job with that lighting. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe you can That's, get um, me. I'm a big fan of uh, cloudy skies because it's good okay, camera yeah, work. Okay. <laughs> so, so Scorsese gave you a, a one up on the rest of us with your lighting. Um, and then I'd, I'd also like to just mention quickly, uh, Mike brought up uh, um, Will Sampson. And, and Will Sampson... Um, was very much a proponent of, of hiring native actors to play native roles. And, and I think that's part of, of, of our excitement about inducting him into the National Native American Hall of Fame is that you know he, was, uh, he wasn't the only one, but he was on the front end of that movement to, to, to ensure that, that uh, it, to make it more correct. I'd also like to just say too to the to the listeners when I mentioned earlier about the complexities and the nuances, it's it's incredibly important to recognize there's 574 federally recognized tribes. There are state recognized tribes. There are uh, 200 different languages spoken, and and oftentimes people talk about the native culture. There is really no such thing as the native culture because we're made up of 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 a lot of cultures. Mm -hmm. and, we're, and I mentioned the diversity that we're all across the country. And, and hopefully the biggest takeaway from, from today's uh, visit is that folks will, it'll pique their curiosity. They'll, they'll uh, do a little more exploration and figure out who we are, uh, that they'll, they'll grab a, a book and they'll pick it up and read a little bit more about who we are. And 
Oscar uh, Hokey just came out with a book called Calling for a Blanket Dance. Mm -hmm. And for those folks in Oklahoma, it is a it is tremendously insightful because it takes you right to the Kiowa people, right to the Cherokee people, right to the essence and the heart of 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 being multi-tribal, growing up multi-tribal, growing up in, in Oklahoma. And and it's and it's a wonderful way to to gather that kind of insight. But but please do take that take that time to think about who we truly are and what we're trying when we're talking about the movies and the industry. What we're talking about is that it's it's not just a singular story. Thank you, Holly. And I'm, I'm so glad that you brought the the question about process up because <clears throat> we've seen the work. Um, you know, Bird Running Water was at at Sundance for mm -hmm. 20 years he recently left Adam Perone is doing a terrific job there now and the the programs that they put together in terms of the labs and and the fellowships to get to get natives on the other side of the camera as well right mm -hmm. which is so important we have um Jane Myers who was just nominated oh, for God, yes. Emmy, yeah. Emmy, Emmys um who was on that side of the camera as the producer of Prey and continues to have a number of projects out there that that process and having those voices and those eyes from from the ground up are are so important in making sure that this this renaissance time that I referred to um, only gets better. And so that process is is um, getting people and teams and not just as consultants, mm -hmm. but as writers which we see, we see, you know, Sierra Teller Ornelas, who was the first um, na woman Native American showrunner um, on Rutherford Falls. We see, as you referenced, you know, what yeah. just ended was a terrific um, three seasons for all of Indian country and a lot of people in America and watching Reservation Dogs, that mm -hmm. all of that, both sides of the camera are so important. Absolutely. That is a perfect example. If you want to look at the situation, like, how do we get it right? I mean, what is the optimum standard that we should be shooting for as an industry? I would say, you know, in the movies, uh, if you're going to have, a, you know, because not every movie is going to have a Martin Scorsese directed. And it's not going to have these A-list actors like uh, DiCaprio and De Niro and, and Gladstone come in and, and, and carry the weight of the film based on their star status. You may have smaller projects that may involve other tribes. And but. If nothing, you can learn that there's a process here of getting that part right. Even if you're not a Scorsese, you can follow Scorsese's process and producing a film that actually is respectful of the, the tribe you're telling the story about or the indigenous people you're telling the story about. Um, Mike, uh, I, I got to throw you a reservation docs question, brother, because uh, this yeah. one hits real close to home. And, uh, and, I, and I just wondered if you could speak to how you feel like the Muscogee Creek people have embraced this story, how they've been engaged in it in, in terms of, of of feeling a sense of pride. That scene in the jail where Molly, uh, Molly, I'm sorry, Lily Gladstone plays Hotkey and she's in, and she's talking to Willie Jack about drawing upon the strength of her ancestors to get her through the troubling times that she was going through. Um, it was such a powerful, moving moment in that the, in the entire series. It's left an indelible mark on my on my psyche, you know, because it spoke to me. I I I literally wept watching that scene. Can you can you talk a little bit about it, Mike? Yeah, I mean, the community has completely embraced that film. I think half my relatives have been in it. You know, there were uh, one of my uh, uh, aunts was in one of the singing scenes. Uh, but yeah, I think they, you know, they, they captured the community life from uh, death, uh, healing, kinship, and all the themes that they really uh, kind of rememorialized in the last episode. Mm -hmm. And the community has completely embraced it. The, the scenes, what I, what I was concerned about is would this resonate, you know, globally na or nationally with other reservations? And it has, mm -hmm. because I think the stories are, are so familiar uh, I wasn't sure the Indian humor would would translate, but it it translated very well. Yeah. Uh, what I'm proud about too is that they had a Native American writers room. Uh, mm -hmm. Some of the guys from the 1491s, like Ryan Redcorn and Dallas yeah. Goldtooth, are in there, uh, and I think that makes a difference. The authenticity when you try to 
I think about some the the dark old days uh, 30 years ago when Pocahontas came out and you clearly did not have a native imprint on that. Uh, the difference between the res dogs. And I think after Killers of the Flower Moon, I think there's going to be a, a continued evolution marketplace for native films. Uh, Holly mentioned the the Sundance uh, Institute. I know she's involved with them. And that's a great place when you talk about process. Um, it's great to have written content and, and actors, but in the end, many, it comes down to financing and, and producing films. And the fact that there are now more uh, executive producers, uh, associate producers and others for film, showrunners, that is going to make a huge difference. And you'll see that both in very small films and large films, you know, in the next in the next year or two as these uh, films come into production. I think one of the things I really admired about the way Sterling Ham Harjo handled this, this entire three-year run uh, was that... You know, it, you see it in other communities. You see it in our own community sometimes where somebody achieves a certain level of fame, they pull the ladder up, you know, and uh, he didn't do that. He did not do that. He he took the opportunity that he had and he brought other people with him. He gave them opportunities to shine. And it it he asked certain people that he had worked with in the past to come in and step in and direct an episode or to help write an episode, like he said, Mike. And, um, and so that there were multiple fingers all over this project that had different visions, different creative juices that were going into it that made the story so fresh. Each one was so uniquely different from the other, even though there was a narrative to the whole story, especially this last season, because they were tying things up. But um I I just uh, I I just want to give a shout out to Sterling because that was a choice he made, and it, it was such a smart choice because, like you said, Mike, the we don't want this to be a one off. We want this to be to be the beginning of a new right. renaissance of indigenous filmmaking, both in front of the camera, behind the camera, and the content. Because what we discovered through both telling an accurate portrayal, reflecting a historical event that happened in our past, like Killers of the Flower Moon, or telling a contemporary story about the lives of indigenous people living today with all the challenges and struggles that contemporary society has placed upon them and the unrealistic expectations that mainstream media has put on us. Yet we still find a way to have our own voice and have our own space to be able to tell this story from our point of view. Um, it, it just, um, I think it's just going to, um, it gives me reason to hope that these are not the exceptions as they have been perceived today, but they're going to be the rule going forward, I think. Um, Holly, if you don't mind, um, I want to dig a little deeper in terms of a little bit about uh, how important it is that we organize a pipeline of content for the industry, because uh, you don't want them to just pick a consultant. You don't want them to just, uh, you know, do it as if it's a PR move. You want the original work to get the best attention from the industry that has the resources to make it real. And uh, it, But the burden is on us too, right? We have to produce. We have to write scripts. We have to go into acting classes. We have, you know, I mean, there's a, there's a TikTok video of a woman that's just going off on how come there's not an Osage playing the lead actress. Well, if we had an Osage that had, you know, worked her way up like through the ranks like Lily did, maybe that argument would make sense. But Lily demonstrated the ability to channel her own indigenous upbringing into this character. But it just speaks to the need for us to be able to do our part. Can you talk a little bit about the work that Illuminative does to help create that. Yes. Um, creating that pipeline, I think puts the, and, and you said, you know, we have that same responsibility to show up in spaces where mm -hmm. we want to be represented and with those same kind of talents. And I, 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 I think of it a little bit in terms of, of politics, right? You know, mm -hmm. back in the day, I think, um, Michael, you remember there just weren't a lot of, for instance, Native Americans doing either, you know, advocacy work. The entire lobbying industry was made up of, of non-natives that were representing mm -hmm. tribes, but we hadn't had enough people in the pipeline 
right? To serve in administrations, to get that sort of Hill experience and do all of that. And now I think, you know, we have such a strong lobbying core made up of Native Americans that represent tribes and not necessarily, you know, I'm Ojibwe, but represent a number of tribes that are not Ojibwe, just, you know, the Mm -hmm. same as Michael. And that is the same thing in the film industry, right? We have to get people in the pipeline. So it's what Sundance does with with the fellowship. Illuminative has had um, a, a, a fellowship um, program with Netflix and others to help get the resources and support. We certainly have the talent, right? Mm-hmm. And we as Indian people, we are storytellers at our core. And I always say, you know, if we didn't have, if we weren't able to laugh, we'd be crying at our, at our own very situation in history, mm-hmm. but that, which is, I think why we have such a well-developed sense of humor in Indian country as well. So though I, there's no lack of talent, what we do need is to provide the opportunities for people to um, develop that talent. And, you know, when you're an artist, you need those sort of resources to, um, to do the work, right? And that is some that takes time and um, I think we're we are seeing some of that. And as we see the Sierra Teller analysis, the Janish meetings, the the writers, the opportunities that Sterling gave to um, Tazva Chavez, you know, all of these folks who are so talented. And I do I see them leaving the ladder down behind them as well. And that I think is what um, them using their platform and opportunity, but I also you know, finding that space. And I know, you know, Michael, you do some of this work in finding that space where that talent can be grown and um, mentored, you know, mentorship in Indian country and and this space, I think is going to be really important. Say, well, um, I don't, um, I'm I'm not asking you to, to, to give us the full width and breadth of what you've been able to experience being married to the director of the National Museum of the American Indian. But could you uh, give us at least a glimpse at the kind of things the museum does as a way of educating the general public about indigenous life, indigenous world that we have all grown up in, how important it is for that to be accurately reflected. I know one of the things that Kevin did when he was in that position was that he opposed the Indian mascot issue in Washington, D.C. He opposed these, uh, the, he, he championed projects such as uh, uh, accurate portrayal of uh, Native Americans, whether it's in Madison Avenue or whether it's in Burbank or Hollywood, uh, because those things affect federal policy in D.C. Uh, the perceptions that the public has that is born from, uh, you know, uh, Land O'Lakes Butter or uh, a Washington football team logo or or some of the uh, perpetual misrepresentations like you talked about of our lives on the screen has an effect on federal policy. Um, the museum stands alone across the street from the U.S. Capitol as a point of education to the world of who we are and what we are and definitely what we're not. Could you talk a little bit about that? Well, um, thanks, Chief Graham. I uh, appreciate that question, and, and I'm um, incredibly proud of my wife. Uh, it uh, um, we just got back from. <clears throat> sorry, um, we just got back from Boston, and where she was inducted into. Uh, the American Academy of Arts and, and Sciences. And we were we were sitting there and we're preparing to go to, uh, I'm sorry for being so damn emotional, but uh, sorry. We, we were preparing to go to the induction ceremony. And she said, I'm not exactly sure how to act. And it dawned on us both at that moment that um, over the past number of years, there have been natives that have been um, inducted into the academy, uh, Louise Erdich, um, Kevin Gover, Suzanne Harjo, uh, Philip Deloria, Mark Trahant, and, and others. But yet, in, in terms of, the, of the, the, the thousands of people that have been inducted into that, uh, that august community, there have been very few natives so so there is no pathway 
to say this is how we act, this is how we accept it. And to see her go across the stage um, and followed right behind her was Glenn Close and, and John Lithgow was there. And I mean, it was wow. and, and the incredible minds that were inducted into the ceremony and then to have um, this um, native woman um, being recognized in that way. It's incredibly important. And the main thing that she that she knows and recognizes is that it, it isn't about her, but it's about us. Mm. And just exactly what you said about the, you know, making sure that the, the ladder is dropped down behind you. Just just this weekend, she was profiled in the Washingtonian magazine as as one of the powerful women of Washington, D.C., wow. included with 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 uh, Jill Biden and, and Kamala Harris and and others. And that and, her, and that's basically what her quote was, was to say that. Um, I'm I'm gratified to be the the first native woman to lead a Smithsonian museum, and she said I'm heartened to know that I won't be the last. Oh, and so, but the thing that the museum and her what they're trying to do, and it's 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 really important because when the museum in 2004 was was opened, uh, Rick West took a different approach to it. He took an approach to it to say we we are going to present our story from our from our perspective, from our words, and in our mm -hmm. words. Well, it it got poor reviews. It was like people didn't want to see that. They want to see the 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 Disneyland Indians. They want to right. see the romanticized Indians. They want to see what they what they saw on television growing up. That they didn't want to see the story that we wanted to tell. Well. The museum was ahead of its time then, and 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 then now that is the is the right story, the proper story. So her vision is number one is there's there's a million uh, piece collection of our belongings of our belongings. That we don't, it's not artifacts and not things. It's our native belongings that are that are out at Suitland, Maryland, mm -hmm. at, at the Cultural Resources Center. She wants to see that collection connected to the communities. Mm -hmm. and, and I'll tell you, I, I have a personal um, um, connection because I found my great grandmother's cradle board that's there in the collection. Holy smokes. That wow. carried my grandmother. It carried my grandmother. So when you find those things, and we all have those things there, and I, I will encourage uh, folks to go to uh, NMAI online and you can search your name, you can search your tribe, you can search for. And you can find things in the collection that are of of your family. So mm. uh, that's one of the things she wants to do. She wants to create partnerships um, outside the museum with with Illuminative and Indian Collective and 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 ARP and other organizations that will be able to take and and take the word out. They also have um, NK three sixty Native Knowledge three sixty. And that too is a movement to be able to educate. So it's uh, Jim, you're absolutely right. It's about education, creating awareness, and then at the same time, though, you have to create that environment there where people, the tourists that are come flocking to D.C., that they can go somewhere and see something that kind of entertains them a bit. But I think and it educates them. Same and time. educates them. Yeah. yeah. Well, mm -hmm. you're educating them sometimes. Um, not exactly, um, you know, forcing it down their throat, but you're, mm -hmm. when they walk out, they know more than when they went in. Exactly. What I will say about what I will say about Killers of the Flower Moon um, when it comes out, um, and I think we're all going to be in Indian country very, very proud of Lily Gladstone. Uh, and mm -hmm. I will say that um, she's my cousin-in-law, so um, I <laughs> have some connection and pride right there. <clears throat> she's going to be a breakout star <clears throat> among huge stars. She's going to be a breakout star. Um, and Jane Myers, when she told me that she was at one point, told me that she was going to produce a movie about Comanches fighting the predator in Canada. I said, <laughs> oh, yeah, sure. That'll, OK. Yeah. <laughs> and then there and there it was. And then it was and, and, and Holly can can uh, talk about probably about the what it did on the streaming and that, you know, met all expectations. You know, the, the, the my only regret is that it was never in the theaters. I, I really oh, wished it was in the yeah. theaters because I would have gone multiple times. It, it, a movie that grants that visually was beautifully done. 
on my computer screen was such a disservice to all the hard work that went into telling <laughs> yeah. that story, you know. So, so, so lastly, what I want to say is, oh, and one more thing about my wife, she's also in the Forbes magazine 50 over 50 too, on that list as well. So she's, yeah. she's kind of on a roll and, and, and she's embracing her platform that this is the place to talk about not me, but who we are and what the museum does. And, and don't forget about the fact that that there is an NMAI in New York City as well. That's right. Park. Uh, so she's responsible for three big institutions. But when Killers of Flower Moon comes out and there's going to be such a buzz and there already is with Reservation Dogs and, you know, and Rutherford Falls and all these other shows that are native content, we have to be kind of protective. Yeah. We and our community, we're going to have to be protective because, as I said earlier, the hucksters, the opportunists, the, mm -hmm. the thieves, they're, they will be coming. And, and what's, Mike Anderson, what's the line in the movie? The wolves? Oh, uh, can, you, can you see the wolves in this picture? <laughs> <laughs> so so they, be will be com they will be coming and they'll be trying to yeah. imitate who we are. They're going to be trying to imitate our, our, mm -hmm. our, 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 our portrayals in, these, in, in, the, in the movie industry. So we've got to be very protective. And not to be on a sour note, but no, 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 I, I agree with you because the <clears throat> my interpretation of that is that we have to take control of our own story and we have to make sure that we're the ones telling it, not somebody else. And then, yeah, Jim, if I, I could I, just make one point on that, just yeah. on our telling our own stories, I mean, I think as we're as we're wrapping here, um, there are a lot of untold stories, a lot of historical narratives for my tribe, there's really never been a great film about the the Trail of Tears. There's been a lot of individual small, you know, tribal productions, but on a mainstream. Uh, there's now been a, a recent great sports story like um, uh, the Harmony Osage beating the New York Giants. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, I was at a, I saw a panel with Wes Studi and he was talking about there hasn't been a, a great romantic comedy uh, mainstream with Native Americans. He, he said, where, where is the guess who's coming to dinner for Native Americans? And I thought, hey, here's the title. Guess who's coming to Wild Onion Dinner? And you know, <laughs> we, can have, we can have that. But I'd love to see a romantic comedy. And some of the uh, investors I've talked to have asked for that. So I'm, I'm hopeful oh, at some point we'll see one of those. That's encouraging. Uh, uh, just to kind of give an ode to a little bit some of the more current dynamics that's happening here in Oklahoma and unfortunately happening in other red states across the country is that there's been laws that have been passed at the state level that is preventing the the, um, the any kind of history being taught in the public schools that may uh, make somebody feel uncomfortable. And, uh, and unfortunately, history is not there to make us feel good. It, unfortunately, it is, uh, it's there to help educate us so that if there were mistakes in the past, like slavery and Jim Crow and Reign of Terror and the, the removals like uh, the Trail of Tears, that they be brought to the attention of this generation in the school books. And right now we're we're fighting a battle right now in Oklahoma. House <clears throat> Bill 1775 is on the books and it has had a chilling effect in the school system from being able to even uh, bring Killers of the Flower Moon into a social studies class. There, there's a story that a teacher in Dewey, Oklahoma, has bought 25 copies of the books for the purposes of educating their students on it. And when that law was passed, she put them in a box and put it in a shelf because the consequences of violating this law would be she would lose her teacher's license and there would be a accreditation to her school system. And none of those things were worth the risk of jeopardizing her career or her school that would even further damage the, the, the school system's ability to teach kids. And uh, if you all have a comment on that, that's fine. If not, I'm, I'm happy to wrap it up, but uh, I just wanted to put that in there because this is a dynamic that's going on. The Lieutenant Governor attended the Cannes Film Festival to promote the fact that Oklahoma give tax credits for this film to be made in Oklahoma. And uh, I just want you to know, um, uh, that I'm glad that the lieutenant governor was there. I really am glad because he was promoting this film for an international audience to see. And when he came back to Oklahoma, a reporter from OSU uh, TV, it's a NPR station based at Stillwater in OSU Tulsa, um, KOSU, I think is what it's called, asked him, how is it possible you are promoting this film to be shown worldwide for everyone to see, while at the same time, you're preventing the content of that story to be taught in public schools. 
you know, these are legitimate questions that are being discussed right now here in Oklahoma and in other red states where these laws are on the books. Um, any comments or questions, observations? It's like I stubbed the uh, panel with that. Well, one. no. <laughs> <laughs> um, the in the uh, in the chat, there's uh, uh, a question and. Um, it was asking us uh, how we feel about Killers of the Flower Moon. Uh, there was a, a post premiere press conference and, and apparently um, Lily Gladstone said um, that the Osage grieved William Hale's incarceration and later death. Um, and so the question is, um, is that revelation surprising? Well, part of William Hale's success in being able to establish himself in the Osage community is he learned to speak the Osage language. He became friends with Osages. Um, he attended Osage gatherings and ceremonies. There's this great photo of one of our Ilonshka dances. Uh, it was kind of a paranamic, paramatic view picture at the time in the 1920s. That is part of it has deliberately been removed from the museum at the Osage Museum because he's in that picture. And um, it, yeah, it's uh, it, it's it's uh, it's difficult to describe that people who pretended to be our friend ended up not being our friend, and even with the trials and the convictions, and eventually his parole in the late 1940s, there were still Osages that had some affection for him, but the vast majority of Osages did not, of course. But we still lived in that time that even though there was those set of crimes that were that got all the attention. What also happened was is that there was a silence that took place for the next 40 years where nobody even talked about. It. And uh, when it was talked about, it was only talked about from the perspective of J. Edgar Hoover, who did a PR movie called The FBI Story, where it was a white savior narrative. And it further alienated the Osages from their own story and from their own relationships to their own family members whose crimes were never investigated. So there's always been this uneasy coexistence that exists in Indian country that between the Indians and the non-Indians that live in our communities, anywhere there was allotment, there were guardians. Anywhere there were guardians, there was graft. It wasn't just an Osage story. It was a five civilized tribe story. It was a story anywhere where the Dawes Act was implemented. And, uh, and these folks, were responsible for the largest transfer of land, according to Angie Debo's book, the, you know, and still the waters run, of the massive transfer of land out of Indian hands into non-Indian hands. And, and this is just one personality out of that entire history. And obviously, there's no way you could have pulled that off if he came in with horns and a tail. He was nice. He was gracious. He was gregarious. He was charming. I don't know how it's to answer. I don't know. Chief Gray, I'll just say that I think um, all of us know that person or persons from uh, from our communities uh, mm -hmm. and and uh, where where in Anadarko there was uh, a person who basically was a loan shark and uh, loaning money a hundred on a hundred and was in collusion with uh, the Bureau of Indian Affairs when folks when they would uh, have a check coming uh, for. Yep oil royalties or whatever it might be and then he'd collect a hundred on a hundred mm -hmm. if they didn't pay up he would you know that they're, they're get their land consequences. <laughs> so yeah. but you know at the end of the day that's how we were taken advantage of because we have a certain loyalty when we take somebody as a friend mm -hmm. and even sometimes when they mistreat us and abuse us um, we don't easily just cast them aside so i can see where where that could have been a possibility where people were saddened by that. And your explanation yeah. is, is, is great. Uh, there's also a question in the chat and maybe you see it, Chief Gray is asking about um, what you're, when you talked about walking in both lands or having two lives, mm -hmm. what is, how do you, how do you ex, uh, expound on that phrase? Well, I, I, when I give a lot of talks, and I know we all do from time to time, people under, try to understand, well, why is it important that we carry these traditions with our people today? Um, we, we live in 2023. 
Well, we owe it to those ancestors who really gave up just about everything in order for this generation to thrive. And whether it's uh, as a result of the success in gaming that has given us the financial resources to reinvest in culture and language preservation, to acquire our, our homelands back, to invest that money into healthcare for our people, it's important to understand that those sacrifices and those the dedicated servants of our people that represent our ancestors are largely responsible for the success that we're enjoying today. And we owe it to them. And, and, and even though we do live in a modern society with modern conveniences, I still believe that you can think and, and live and exist and succeed in this world, but you, you can do it with the heart of your indigenous people the whole time. And it makes you a better person. It makes you whole. And I think in a way, it gives you a sense of uh, perspective that your goal in this life is to hopefully leave that woodpile a little higher than what you found it for that next generation. Those kids are growing up so that they will have the benefits that you have. Well, uh, I want to wrap up in the sense of... Uh, does anybody have anything they would like to plug? If they do, this would be a wonderful opportunity. I'll start with you, Holly. Ladies first. Uh, anything I would like to plug? Uh, yeah. Um, Any project you're working on you'd like to share with the audience? Uh, anything of that nature? Uh, yes, I have been working very hard on the effort to free Leonard Peltier and advance his clemency petition and gain the attention of President Biden in, um, in either granting clemency or, or the support for his petition for compassionate release. I think we've reached a tipping point in terms of the number of members of the prosecution who have stepped forward. And I, I compare it to this, um, the secret service agent a couple of weeks ago who um, was profiled in the Washington post. He was, he rode on the, um, the car that, President Kennedy was in when he was shot. He's 92 years old. He wanted to um, tell his story and he spoke out for the first time, some of which differed from the Warren Commission um, rendering of that day. But I, I compare it because I think folks who are a part of these moments in history and they have this crisis of conscience and want to step forward and everyone from the judge in Leonard's case to the U.S. attorney who handled the prosecution and appeal to the FBI agent in charge of um, the Minneapolis area office at the time have stepped yeah. forward and recognized that they couldn't prove that Leonard committed a crime on the Jumping Bull Ranch that day, have acknowledged the racism that was present and um, in and the atmosphere that was funded and created by the U.S. government in Pine Ridge at that time, and the fact that 27 multinational corporations had filed for the mineral rights on Pine wow. Ridge and in, and in the Dakotas at that time. The background to this story is one that um, should be told, needs to be told, and a man has served um, nearly 49 years in prison. And um, right now, and, and, and I always say, I'm not relitigating this case. It's about justice. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. That was such an important cause that's uh, on top of mind with a lot of people in the Indian community. And uh, please give your husband uh, our congratulations for receiving his, uh, what was it, a Lifetime Achievement Award of some type? Uh, yes. What did he get? He got the, the Lifetime Achievement Award by um, NAFOA, which is taking place right now. So I oh, will. I will. Dead uh, good. Good deal. Uh, Mike, what, what are you working on? Yeah, well, I mentioned the National Native American Hall of Fame. Our gala, mm -hmm. annual gala is uh, Saturday. We have six inductees. Uh, Mark Trahan from Indian Country Today. Lameda Warjack was an AIM activist back in the day. Joe Dela Cruz, very well-known uh, Quinault Tribal Chair. Richard Trudell, a lawyer that really initiated a lot of law careers, uh, and Will Sampson uh, from my tribe. So mm -hmm. uh, that is uh, online. They have uh, information if you want to go online, but that's uh, the next project I'm working on. Excellent. Well, anything happen? Well, yeah, sorry. I just picked up a cold and I'm um, um, now I have a coughing fit going on, but I will say this. Um, uh, Holly is is an an absolute strong advocate for anything and everything that she does, and 
if if I ever get in a bind, I want her behind me to <laughs> get it, to get to get me uh, out of whatever bind that is. And I think <clears throat> Mike Anderson will be um, at some point um, um, leading the effort to for a big movie production. And when he does, I'm I'm looking for uh, a role. Uh, so <laughs> make sure that you include me in include me in that in that big movie production. But I'm I'm very I'll just say I'm very proud to be uh, um, included with uh, with the three of you in in this podcast and and I think it's the the, the absolute most important thing is is always and 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 never underestimate um, the power of our voices. Absolutely, I couldn't well think of a better way to end that. Um, you guys, you have been great and a great sports and uh, and. You know, next time we all get together at whatever in an event that brings us all together, I'm going to make sure Yancey buys us uh, at least a round of coffee in honor of the Coffee <laughs> for Democrats for honoring us with this uh, hosting responsibilities and having this particular subject on their platform to discuss. And uh, and I thank you all very much. And uh, Kevin, if you can unmute, I'll turn it back over to you to uh, finish this out. Well, it's such an honor and a privilege to have everybody here with us on Coffee with Democrats. Really, it's it, it, this is one of the premier shows of the year. Mm-hmm. And I really want to thank everybody for taking your time to come on and, and be with, with Chief Gray today and, and talk about this. I wanted the, the whole my whole goal was to not be seen during this entire broadcast. Mm-hmm. Um, the only thing we're going to do is talk just a little bit about how we're going to rebroadcast this. We're going to rebroadcast it tonight at 8 p.m. We're going to rebroadcast it again on Thursday morning on the 5th at 10 a.m. And then um, Thursday evening at 8 p.m. And then we'll have it again Sunday at uh, 8 p.m. Our next guest on Coffee with Democrats, we're reaching out to Representative Arturo Alonzo Sandoval from uh, the um, Oklahoma 50th District, I think it is, from Oklahoma City. We're going to ask for him to come out. This is um, um, uh, uh, Latino uh, Month. Uh, help me out here. I'm I'm, I'm throw, throwing a blank here. It's Latino Recognition Month, I think it is. And uh, so we're wanting to make sure that that uh, he is able to come back on and talk with us and, and have uh, an opportunity to talk about his activism within the Latino community. Uh, he's a great guy, just a fantastic guy. He graduated from OU. So all of you with uh, with um, uh, OU Heritage, uh, University of Oklahoma Heritage, raise your hand. Um, <laughs> we're 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 real, we're going to be well represented. He is a. Uh, uh, an OU graduate uh, with an architecture degree. So we're looking forward to having him come back on on the 12th and talk to us. So uh, it's a, it's Latino Heritage Month. I'm sorry. Um, I drew a blank there. And, uh, I, 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 again, don't mean any disrespect to anybody. I just, uh, I'm, a, I'm a dumb old man. So <laughs> uh, uh, thank you, uh, everybody, for being on here. So uh, I, again, thank you very much, everybody, for uh, for being gracious, gracious, um, you, Jim, you're a great host, and well, everybody for being. It was my first time, so gracious I didn't know what was guests. Happen. So <laughs> you're, you're, are, you're, a nat- you're a natural at it. And yeah, <laughs> excellent job. Yes, yes we are thrilled, and, and, we're gonna, and if we can do this again sometime, um, you know, if there's a, if you know, we get closer to the 20th of October, and we decide, hey, we got to do something else in recognition of uh, K2FM or um, or when Yancey is released, then uh, from his, <laughs> from his, uh, bondage. I don't know what you, his bondage, yeah, maybe we can do something else with him. But uh, what a great show. I mean, this is fantastic. This has been another thrilling episode of Coffee with Democrats featuring our special guest host, Chief Jim Gray. We hope that you have enjoyed today's program and we appreciate your continued support. We invite you to join us next time as we continue to open progressive conversations from all of our friends across the great state of Oklahoma and beyond. All right. Thank you, everybody. And I greatly appreciate everything. Thank you. See you guys. Thanks, Jim. Bye. Bye. See you, Kevin.